Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event with Roger Bennett in conversation with Nick Kroll discussing Reborn in the USA, an Englishman's love letter to his chosen home. Tonight's event will end with a Q&A, and to submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. If you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, you can click the Like button, and it'll bump it up in the queue, and we will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Please also feel free to engage with each other and the conversation in the chat area. And we'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future. And you can learn more about them on our website by signing up for our email newsletter. You can follow us on social media at BookSoup. And you can also follow our Crowdcast page right here for direct notifications. And past events are also available on our YouTube channel. And your ticket for tonight's event comes with a signed and unique book plate from Rogers. So we appreciate your support of independent bookstores and hope you enjoy. We're also open for in-store browsing. So if you are local to Los Angeles, you're welcome to come by the store, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. daily, and we would love to see you. And with that said, let me introduce our guest for this evening. Roger Bennett is a broadcaster, podcaster, and filmmaker who has, through Men in Blazers, become one of the most prominent football broadcasters in the United States. Along with Michael Davies, Men in Blazers has turned a weekly Premier League podcast into a popular television show on NBCSN, covering multiple sports, including women's soccer, golf, and the NHL. He is the co-author with Davies of the New York Times bestseller, Men in Blazers, presents Encyclopedia Blazer Tanica, and has also, also co-authored Bar Mitzvah Disco, Camp Camp, and You Shall Know Us by the Trail of Our Vinyl. Now, Roger's going to introduce Nick tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to Roger. And please sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. We are so excited to have you both at BookSoup. Oh, thank you, Sam. This is Rog. I'm delighted to be with you for this evening of conversation, the celebration of my book, Reborn in the USA. And I'll say the reception across America has been so bloody humbling. But it's also a night to support American Indies in general and one incredible jewel of a store in particular, Book Suit, that magnificent kingdom on Sunset Boulevard, West Hollywood, and I want to thank all of you who are joining us to support this gem live. It means a lot to us. It really does support your American Indies now. And this is a really special evening for me because my book's been out in the world for over a month. And I'm genuinely humbled by the reception it's received across America. But I feel like I've talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. My journey, my American. So I've talked about it up the wazoo. And it's really hard to keep talking, partially because I'm both English by birth and also Jewish. So I've like been cursed in life with a double portion of self-loathing. So I never really enjoy talking about my own crap, which is almost why I defer to football. But because this book is my story, you know, I've had to keep talking about it a lot. So tonight feels special because for the first time in the whole Reborn in the USA Palooza, I'm actually speaking with a family member, and I, I'm going to break it to you. It's not my dad, and I know so many of you would like a return of Ivor Bennett to the pod. It's not happening. I'm going to bring up my brother-in-law, who's a remarkable gem because he is one of America's most sought-after creators in the arena into which I dip my toe lightly with Reborn in the USA. He's the man dubbed as the Picasso of puberty by the New York Times. He's a co-creator. He's the co-life force, really, behind Netflix's Big Mouth and the forthcoming Human Resources. Coming out spring 2022, a workplace comedy which will be set in the world of the Big Mouth creatures and monsters. Let's bring him up. Nick Kroll, you beautiful bloke. Hey, it is Raj. an incredible joy to be with you. A, a joy to be with you as well. Uh, as you've been at many family events, this is straight vodka. It'll look like water. <laughs> <laughs> You're drinking a Budweiser. This is... Just pure smear knob. <laughs> that old family trick. I am genuinely fascinated to talk to you because I spend all my time talking about life as is represented by sports. You know, to me, football is just a small story, trapping the big story, human motivation, dreams, shattered dreams, the pursuit of glory, failure, tenacity. But you've made a career out of really just going right to the heart of the matter because. 
you know, my book, I'm new to write about puberty, adolescence, the agonies of, but you, you've made it your canvas. And I want to know, was that planful or was it just accidental? Um, you know, I, I would say a little, well, to be honest, really my career got started doing Bar Mitzvah Disco with you, um, a book uh, about people's stories and pictures of Bar Mitzvahs from the 70s to the 90s and really began began my was the first thing I ever actually really made and it was the beginning of a, a delving into this period of time in in life <laughs> um uh which was feels like I mean feels like about 15 years ago which is what it which is what it is uh or more 16 so um but I think that I uh, Big Mouth sort of fell into my lap in that Andrew Goldberg, my one of my co-creators and uh, executive producers, uh, who is my Jamie Glassman uh, in many ways, um, who I've known since I was in first grade and became best friends with the middle school, um, uh, was who is a, a kinder, better person uh, than me, just like Jamie is with me. Just like Jamie Glassman. <laughs> um <laughs> He and Mark Levin and Jen Flacke, who I co-created the show with, came to me. I had just finished a Kroll show and wrapping up the league and, and was figuring out what the next thing was. And they came to me with this idea for an animated show about uh, about based on me and Andrew and, and our puberty and adolescence. And it, it really immediately felt like a, uh, something that would made sense and resonated with me. Uh, and specifically the idea of... Andrew was a very early bloomer and I was a very late bloomer um, in, and similar to, you know, what you write about in the book um, uh, of the dichotomy of those two, those two groups of people, specifically in the showers, in your showers, we, we had camp showers, but um, it, 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 it created, we were friends through it all. And so there was some dynamic that what we realized is in doing this book or doing our, our show was, whether you were an early bloomer or a late bloomer, you felt alone and the stakes felt very high. And so it felt very rich territory to, to make a show about. Yeah, I just filmed with Tom Hanks talking about Band of Brothers. And one of the things I was really fascinated by was that, you know, he and Steven Spielberg devoted years of their life to making Saving Private Ryan. They were done with that. Oscars were world-renowned. And then they decided after years of work on that to throw themselves back several more years mining the same themes on Band of Brothers and hearing him talk about how he felt compelled. Yeah, we all have a certain amount of creative bandwidth to dedicate more to the themes of the Second World War is really fascinating. Adolescence is turning out to be your Second World War. You keep, <laughs> keep, keep tapping into it. Yeah. I mean, how, how do you understand it that like, is it subconscious, the repeat going back to the adolescent well? Um, it is a bit subconscious. I mean, I think we are, we go to the things that fascinate us, that fear, that uh, scare us, that, that delight us. And I think um, that period of time was incredibly formative for me. And, you know, and I've known you over 20 years now. And in reading your book, I can, in a weird way, know you better through the writing of it, of, of, of similar feelings of of being the kid who didn't want to go to the who was going to wrap his his himself in the towel deeply before going to the shower um and <laughs> and how that becomes so formative in who we are how we we use our our sense of humor our intelligence our uh as as both a way to charm people but also defend ourselves against people um which is something that i definitely developed in that period of of time I don't know if you're yeah. going to say something. No, no I was, I'm just fine. If you knew me 20 years ago, Nick, that means I hadn't gone through puberty when we first met, which is, um, <laughs> which is, which is, that takes me back. It takes you back yeah. to those days. Yeah. But I mean, God, I, you said already, and I am fascinated by it, that your success, which has been a wonder to behold, is even more remarkable when you know, as you did, that you succeeded despite surviving working with me on the book bomb it's for this game which if you haven't seen it people it was a uh, i'd say it was an early internet project in which we used the power of the web it was genuinely hilarious and, we, and though, when we started we wanted to collect bar and batman's and photographs of the 1980s and all it took in those days to blow up 
this is how crazy the internet was back in the day was to be covered by Gorka once. That just like that just made everything happen. And there's a reason I want to go back to it because the question I want to ask you about it, which I'm genuinely fascinated by, but can we just relive what happened to that book? I don't know if you remember, like the instant success when the book came out, coupled with the sudden implosion of the thing. And I don't know if you remember why, you know, the book did so well, but then suddenly imploded. We don't need to mention any names if you do, but do you remember that? I do very clearly. And I had, I, I was, as I was reading your book, I was wondering names, what names are, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what names are real and what are not. Um, because there's a lot of names. I know Jamie Glassman's name is real, but I was like, is it Lisa Marie? Like, I was curious, like, I'm like genuinely curious inside of here. <laughs> Nick and I wrote a book and we didn't know what we were doing. And we we're just so psyched to have a book out. We didn't know you were meant to change names when you said things that were slightly dodgy. And there was one thing by a quite well-known author that was slightly dodgy. And the book came out the tracks, just massive. Like everyone was like, oh my God, this book is so funny or I emotionally relate to it. And then um, I'll just say a dad of one of the uh, people mentioned in the book whose name wasn't changed was a very fine litigator. I'll just say a very, very fine litigator and sued everybody. And so they had to, to, they had to recall the, the book. And then I don't know how they did this. And if you are watching this or listening to this podcast later and uh, you actually did it, they hired people to slice out the essay with, um, with yeah. razor blades and then got it back out into bookstores by the time of which everyone had moved on from Bar Mitzvah it, Disco. It was I'm getting truly hives thinking about it because I remember receiving an email that just had nothing in it and it just <laughs> said it just had an attached document. So I didn't read it for like a few days because I was like... <laughs> I, you know, I thought it was a spam, and then I opened it, and it was in a very official letter from a oh, a very good lawyer who made it clear that one of the authors had not changed the name of. And uh, I, I mean, we won't get more specific. Um, that, but... we're, we're essentially we're essentially all going to prison. But right. I will say the nice thing about that book for me is that it was the book where I met the editor of Reborn in the USA, the mighty Carrie Thornton. And yes. like that, that, that journey, Nick, to me is, I mean, this is a bit of a segue, but it's, I've learned a lot of life lessons through, through this book, Reborn in the USA, you know, like just the joy of indie bookstores and supporting them in dark moments. I've, I've felt a lot of joy from talking about my grandfather, Sam, and, um, and also Mr. McNally, my teacher, who's kind of the hero of the book, who are both deceased and talking about them a lot on the radio and television really brings their memory back to life, which is amazing. But more than anything, I've learned that greatness can come out of bad experiences and relationships forged in one moment, a dark moment even, can come back and play a dominant role in your life later down the line. Mm -hmm. But I want, I want to talk about Bombing to this game because you're in your early 20s when that book came out. Mm -hmm. and there's a photo. We all decided, you know, we collected everybody's bar and bat mitzvah photos. And then we said, yeah, we should put one of the, you know, we should all put our own bar mitzvah photos at the front by, you know, by the introduction. And there's a photo of you at the front of bar mitzvah disco. It's from you at your bar mitzvah. You're on the dance floor. You know, the one surrounded by girls. There's a oh, lot yeah. of Laura Ashley going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you should describe I mean, You're in a suit. Hand, you, you told I'm wearing, me at the a, time yeah, I'm wearing that, a double breasted yeah. polo suit, and I look, I, I think I described it as I look like a, a corporate lawyer who's just found out he's not making partner. <laughs> um, and <laughs> and I think it's it's a weird, and I don't know if you can identify with this, but you, you've been at events with, for, with me and for me, we've both been at each other's events with family and stuff like that. And you know, I it I love being um, I love being a performer. I've done it professionally. There's nothing I like doing more. It's been such a privilege in my life that I that I've been able to do it. Um, and yet, like bar mitzvahs, like my bar mitzvah was one of the worst experiences of my life. And and I mean, in, in what a privileged life I lead. But like, it's not a fun. It was not a fun experience. Just as reading about your bar mitzvah, I found similarly. In, in its own way, it was not as someone who liked to perform, but then it was like we were being put on stage, but not by choice in some way, you know, like we weren't like, we're choosing to do this today because this is what we do. 
uh, our yeah, bar your, mitzvah. Your, your, your Hebrew stand-up set is really shitty. You know, like we, and I think I, uh, I, I, I also had a, uh, looking back, I had, you know, family member who, whose behavior was not good at the, at the bar mitzvah. And, um, um, and, you know, I think I, I look back on it and now my, my wife now will go to a wedding and, and I'll be like furious. Someone will be drunk and be chatting away during someone else's speech and I'll chastise them. And, and my, my it's wife, just, like, it's just moments for trauma. I know it's, she's like, you're the behavior police. And I'm like, I am at a wedding or I'm like, you better behave. Like it's weird, but I think it's some trauma left over from my bar mitzvah feeling like my moment was taken by someone else, you know? Yeah. I mean, that that's what is so fascinating, that trauma. I and mean, that's what I really want to talk about. Cause the funny enough, the bar mitzvah chapter for me was the one I felt worst about writing. Like I, I, I've i never really, I, my mum and dad will find out exactly what I thought about my Bar Mitzvah through this book. And I think it's probably deeply violating because it is a gift. But I remember when we printed that photograph, your early 20s, and you were still close enough to that photograph that even though we you were able to laugh at it a little bit, it was clear as we talked about it that the, 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 the pain of the moment mm. had not had not fully burnt off then. Back then, it, it had you're still like it was like what eight, nine, ten years out. And I'm wondering, does the trauma of the moment does it ever truly fully burn off? You know, as having made this show now for we've just finished writing season six, that um in a weird way it does it does and it doesn't. I mean, I like I think we're privileged that we get to uh use our art. Uh, if you want to call what we do art, uh, to um, to act as therapy on some level, that it is, I, I, it's therapeutic to to have to process aloud what you have gone through. I think on some level, bring I don't know, has it brought you any solace in in processing it through this? You know, I wrote this book in a fever dream during COVID. So COVID had started. I was in Manhattan, the land of my dreams as a kid. Um, and the land of my dreams as a kid was overwhelmed by, by human darkness and confusion. Um, so I kind of plunged into this. This was not a meticulous piece of planning. This was not a, uh, okay, we're doing this like a piece of sculpture that I began. I really, I mean, the whole thing, the, 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 the very act, the big picture act of writing the book was deeply therapeutic. I, I really did lock myself up for, four and a half months as a photograph that I published when the book hit the bestsellers list that um, that my wife, your sister, Ness, um, took of me staggering out having finished my first draft. And it was really the first time I'd gone out into the sunlight in four and a half months, Nick. I mean, I'd like grown that Tom Hanks kind of castaway beard that looks so good on Hanks and looks so patchy on Rog, because even though now I have gone fully to puberty, the beard growing thing is still still a bridge too far. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my arms were like stick, like translucent sticks. A number of our friends just texted Ness saying, please tell Roger to take that photograph off the internet. It's truly a horror. <laughs> so like, I think the whole, the, the moments of writing it were less therapeutic than the black hole that I, I plunged into to write it. But... I mean, just I don't mean to keep banging on about a photo that is was once a cause of pain. Mm. But the other the other delicious note about it is you had deliciously big glasses. We both had big glasses at our bar mitzvahs, Nick. I think big glasses on small children is a special kind of trick. I don't know what we were. I don't know if we thought it made us look more adult or I don't it definitely wasn't. God. What was it? What do you think it was that was like? Because I'm, I think about it now. I'm like, well, why was I wearing big tortoiseshell glasses? You were wearing literal woman's glasses. Yeah, I, I like the way you're relegating me slightly. Like you, oh, no, no, I, you, you know, I I'm, I'm trying to, but bo- I'm trying to bond us together. You're no. picking me apart. Like, no, 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 no. I just, I, I, I'm, I'm jealous, like, I'm maybe. jealous of the beauty of the description of wearing women's glasses. I'm, I, I'm, I am envious of that <laughs> of that detail. Um, it was, there was a. Comed- I think you've nailed it. I, I didn't think it through or else I've forgotten it. There was a comedian on English television. I, I wanted to be something that I wasn't. Um, and so you want to be 
things you see outside of yourself. And there was a British comedian, Ben Elton, who I thought was like stand up had really just started on on English television. He was one of the first and he was very intelligent. He was a London guy. His mouth moved so fast. His brain moved faster. And he had a he had a pair of glasses very like it. And I do think when I went to an optician's and needed glasses, I, I was like, I was projecting to be the mm. person I wanted to be funnier, louder, cleverer, more, you know, um, out there. Hence women's glasses. I think I wanted, I, I don't know if I thought I would, if I had bigger glasses, I would appear bigger. I mean, we all wore bigger, you know, you, I'm a few years younger than you came up, you came up like Beasties and Run DMC. Uh, and I came up like Raider starter jacket uh, style. And so for me, that was, uh, that was huge for me to be able to wear something that gave me more size, you know, that gave me more, uh girth let's just say um and <laughs> in all manners speaking but i but i think that just going back to your question i think it, it has been therapeutic for me to be able to process that time in life and and honestly then going to therapy and talking about the things that we're talking about and, you know realizing that the things that i was talking about in therapy were the things that i was going was was still the stuff that i was processing from when i was 13 and that it's such a foundational period of time in life that then really does for for good and bad have such profound effects on who you become um and and i think i then would take stuff i'd be talking about in therapy and bring it to the room and try to be honest about what i was processing in therapy and then we would come up with story points in the writer's room that i would then bring to therapy and be like well uh, this is what we're talking about in the room, you know, like uh, that, you know, there's a point in, in Big Mouth where Nick takes on a, a female hormone monster. And, you know, I it was originally just, oh, this will be an interesting story point. But then I brought it into therapy. I was kind of like, you know, we're talking about Nick getting the Connie, the hormone monstrous as his hormone monster. And, and, you know, the more we talked about in therapy, it was like, oh, well, I think the truth was, is I had two older, I had an older brother and then two older sisters, one of whom is your wife, Vanessa, who was a huge influence on me um, in, in how I observe the world and how I process the world. And, and I, and because of her, I think in a lot of ways, I cared a lot of feminine energy and like, um, it made me a good friend to girls, I think, but also not necessarily the guy that girls want to, to jump into bed with in, in middle school and high school. Um, and, and so in processing like a story point of Big Mouth, it's like, well, you know, he's got a hormone monster. So he's processing for me in this lifelong journey of being like, oh, well, I carry more feminine qualities that that are are that have, you know, become are, are a core part of who I am. Um, but I was I either wasn't aware of or was denying or embarrassed or ashamed of that element of who I was in in many ways growing up. You know, I'm not outing you because you've already mentioned it. We both wore big glasses. We were also both late bloomers. Being a small boy in a world of men is a special agony. And when I look back on my experience, which I set out in chapter five of the book, just locker room talk, at the time, so much of that experience was 24-7, devastatingly, humanly crushing. And I never talked about it for a decade. And I'm fascinated, stories you found awkward because of what you do. And, and that interplay between the writer's room and therapy and bouncing back backwards and forwards is, is genuinely, that blurring is, is mind-blowing. Stories you found awkward. Do you now love that feeling of awkwardness because you know that's the equivalent of finding mm. gold, human gold, is awkwardness? Is it is awkwardness, funnily mm. enough, now a place in which you are utterly comfortable? Uh, I'm definitely comfortable with other stories, with other people's. Uh, like I am, if if I can, if people will allow me, you know, as, as someone now who runs a writer's room or helps people develop their material or shows or movies, 
I, I, I luxuriate in, in other people's <laughs> awkwardness and I myself don't find it awkward. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not made uncomfortable by it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just fascinated by it because I, because I have found that that's where, that's where the gold is, you know? And I, and I think the, 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 the gold is not the, for me, necessarily the feeling of uncomfortableness, but in, in the, in the stakes of it, the stakes of awkwardness, the stakes of, of the feeling of awkwardness is such a uh, is such a visceral feeling, and if you can connect your audience to that feeling of awkwardness for you, Raj, in that long like what reads reads like a like a <laughs> Holocaust oven uh, <laughs> for boys to shower in uh, <laughs> to my much smaller version of summer camp shower, <laughs> similar to what you talk about or, or um, uh, that, that, that whether you were in that, those showers or not, you can, you can connect it to your own awkwardness or, you know, in, in helping with other people's stories of being, of, of being in a relationship and, and, and it being outed to a, a much larger group of people or, or um, or whatever whatever the examples are of stories that I'm like t titillated by, um, it's not to luxuriate in, in the in it. It's it's more just it's where the it's where the meat is. You know, it's where the it's where the good it's where I, the juicy you see, stuff is. Your joy listening to that is that you get to do it in a group. Writing a book is such a solo endeavor, and I'm laughing because my threshold. That chapter that I wrote, chapter five, I, I just made myself laugh all the bloody time. Like it was my pain, but I wasn't like, I wasn't in a, I wasn't like listening to, it wasn't like a Kate Bush album of agony. It was like genuinely, I just kept giggling. I found the whole thing from a distance really bloody funny. Well, do you feel, I, did you feel as though in writing it and thinking back on that, it did, having not talked about it for many years, as you said, did, did you feel like you had moved from beyond from it or does, does it sit inside of you? Does it, does it still live in, in there inside of you? No, I, I, um, I mean, your sister, my wife has started this puberty podcast, which I just taped. And it was only when I was talking about it that I realized the second I actually went through puberty, it was like such a release. Like it was over the second, the second there was hair down there. It was like, I'm in. I'm in the club. Like the pain, the agony went away, and I never thought about physical anything again. Having said that, I did just today get a letter from camp from my daughter, um, where she just read the book at camp, and her, her review of the book is, "Daddy, your childhood was very, very sad. It made <laughs> me cry." So, <laughs> what made me laugh, I think, uh, is fairly appalling, uh, according to to my daughter's eye. And but I have been asked a lot <laughs> in interviews whether I wish I'd gone through puberty at a normal time and not lived through the humiliation of it all or the humiliation of what Gail King, my hero, called to my face live on breakfast television, living with a tiny, bald child, spigot penis. I, I want to know, if you were given a do-over of the whole experience again, would you prefer to have gone earlier? Um, oof. I would have preferred, I would have preferred to go like, I don't think I needed to be like an early bloomer, but I would have, I would have, I would, would I, huh. I would take an average bloomer. I don't think if, I think I still would have been small. I think I was some, so much of who I was, was formed at that point. I would take a little of the pain off of it. I think, I don't know. I, wait, wait, but yeah, yeah, I mean, this is, I, this is the kind of question I hate because I don't think you can be hypothetical about history. If the plot against Hitler had worked, would the war have ended sooner? We never know you are what you are. But for me, Liverpool was survival of the fittest. It was all about strength, power, brute force. And I had none of those. So I did. I learned to use my mouth. As you said, you, I mean, we both, I guess, learned to be, you know, quick of mouth because... Really, there was no other way. All the other way was so devastating. When you are tiny, you have to be mouthy. You have to learn to use your mouth as a weapon, a shield, mm -hmm. and a sword. Um, you know, you know I, did, 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 I wonder, like, how much of you turned to humor to use laughter to heal that trauma? Mm. I, I mean, I think, I wonder if I had been an, an earlier bloomer, but, but still the youngest in my family. I, I put a lot on birth order. 
um, being the youngest of four and, and you know my family, the siblings better than anybody. Um, and I think there's a, a, oftentimes the youngest be, can become performers. Uh, um, so I, I, I could have been slightly earlier in my, in my, my progress, but I, but I, but I, I, I don't, it's so hard to, it's so hard to know. Um, and I, I, I mean, I attribute a ton of it. I, I was also just like, you know, I look at Andrew on the other side, my co-creator, Big Mouth, who, who had a beard like this by the time he was in seventh grade and had a, had a mustache in sixth grade and his parents made him, they waxed his upper lip and he couldn't, he couldn't grow. He couldn't grow. And then for years he could grow a beard like this, but nothing right here, which we, oh, so we called it his reverse Hitler. Speaking of uh, the plot against Hitler um, and you know, and that whatever trauma he dealt with as being an acne ridden uh, early bloomer with uncontrollable desires and, and uh, impulses formed him at, at comedically. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. Do you think you would have ended up where, where do you think you would have ended up in, if you had been a, like more in the middle or early? I think I'd probably be, I mean, I don't like to be hyperbolic about things. I'd probably be, 125 goals for England, captain at this point, leading them to World Cup glory and looking to defend the title. There's no doubt if you'd gone early, if you'd gone uh, early, you'd probably be QB1 for the New York Giants right now. It's nice to think about it. But instead, we were left for that life cycle of pain from being too just, traumatic. I'm, pi I'm picturing this alternate universe where. You are now. It's it's the Euro Cup and the fifth, <laughs> the fifth gen coming up for the for the penalties is a <laughs> it's a fifty year old rather fancy fancy dad of Roger Bennett cut yeah, sleeves, sleeves of Beckham tats. It'd be a different, yes, it's tanky. It'd be a different neck tats, different. I'd be like the Biff from her from Back to the Future, Roger. It'd be the old Turner, Roger. Oh. Um, Oh God, I'd love to bite your arm off to be Biff from Back to the Future. The but dream. you know, that that life cycle of being too traumatic to talk about, to uh, being liberating to talk about it, you are in there, and that's what makes your work profound because it is hilarious, but it's also serious. And then it's also if I had another hand, I'd be waving at it. It's also bloody authentic, which mm. is what makes it so awkward and remarkable. And also because society is uncomfortable talking about puberty which is really insane because it's the one thing that every human being goes through around the world but we never ever talk about so with those three things which is most important to you you know the balance of comedy mm -hmm. awkwardness and authenticity in writing what's more important to you or do you even think about them as separate at this point um i i, I i'm you know What's interesting is I think until Big Mouth and Big Mouth for me, and I'm curious how it will, what it will do for your work after writing this book, a much more personal work than you've, you've written in the past is, is it, 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 I feel like I was, um, I've seen the benefits of, of becoming more vulnerable and more forthcoming um, and, and mining that for the war, you know, for the art um and people because i think the other thing with being like like you know late bloomers quick mouthy uh boys who've turned in turn into you know quick mouthy adults men is that you, you can use that as a, as a screen from allowing people in both in your day-to-day -day life but also in your art you know we can come up with funny one-liners that will uh get a, a laugh but not really let people in um and i i feel we've been, I've been rewarded in Big Mouth for being more vulnerable and authentic. And, um, and so I, I've been trying to challenge myself and, and the other people I work with to dig deeper into that and be more honest and authentic, which it has an, it's had an effect on my stand up. It's had an effect on everything I do because I've seen the rewards of being more, more forthcoming. Uh, and I don't know if that's how you feel as well about where, where, where would that land for you? You know, it's, um, it's been fascinating. Writing about your own personal pubescent trauma encourages other people to share theirs with you. You know, I wrote about losing my virginity in this book 
and have now had so many people feel compelled to tell me about their special night. And let's just say I am not worthy. And I'm fascinated because you are modeling a whole new model of being in terms of facing uh, up to, to that time. How do you handle that? Well, I think lots of, um, I think this generation, because of social media and everything, it's ex somewhat expected that you are going to be self-revelatory. Um, what, but where where I differ is that that oftentimes that's expected on like a daily basis and not always necessarily very curated, or it's overly curated and not necessarily authentic. Um, the the difficulty of of writing a, a memoir as you've done and locking yourself away for four and a half months, um, <laughs> or writing a show is it takes a long time uh, and you get to really sit with that stuff and really decide what it is you want to share and how you want to share it. Um, and I think, you know, we, we, we are being, re I think, hopefully rewarded for that. Um, and so that, that's, that's where I have, that's sort of where I've seen the benefits of it. And, um, but I also, it's a, I don't know if you found this of like, how much to share how where is the line what is the boundary of what is what is what is okay to share of mine of my friends stories of my family stories of who they are and and i'm curious for you how that was to to do uh you know the the family thing is fascinating um mining family stories you know, my book is is my story it's my family story too there's a lot of bennett life in that bad boy which is, I want to be honest, a bit like wandering into a bloody minefield by mistake. I'd be lying if I didn't think about it before. If I tried to say I didn't think about that before I started. Yeah, I did crash read uh, Mary Carr's pretty excellent book, The Art of Memoir, before I started tapping away on the keyboard. And she wrote a lot about it, a lot about it. I mean, with like um flashing lights which essentially just boiled down to write your truth i mean every writing book i read about memoirs just kept saying write your truth write your truth but writing your truth is never the other person's truth ever 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 um and that is that that you cannot you cannot i even i even laugh about that in the acknowledgements you know that i, I say to my mum and dad um i cannot wait for you to write your book about being the parents of an asshole kid who's, who was lost in his own imagination and uh, was not very present on a practical level in any way, shape or, or um, at all. But, you, you know, part of what encouraged me is that you, in your comedy sets, in Big Mouth, mm -hmm. in life in general, you mine your family stories a lot. And I'm wondering what what are the ground rules you've adopted to do it without, you know, breaking glass in emergency? Um it's an ever evolving thing. And, and I, and I don't know if I've always done it well. And I think there are, there are times where I'm like, huh, was that okay for me to do? I mean, there are definitely times where I've thought that and, and still think that. And, you know, I, the, what I like as I go forward and now that I have my own, now that I have a son and a wife um, of trying to figure out like who, who is the target of uh who's the target of this? If it's, if, um, because you know as as writers the rest of the your family might be in your book but they didn't volunteer to be writers we decided to write a show or write a memoir so it's a very fine line and and i don't know I, i'm still navigating what that means to to uh, and i think it it also depends on the individual family member or friend who can handle what and how and how you and how you portray different people based on 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 what you think their sense of humor is about themselves what their that kind of stuff but it, it's 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 something that is like you know a hard thing I've, I've been reading uh calvin trillin's family man i don't know if you ever read that it was a gift um and he and it's talking about just what it's like to live with a writer and like how complicated that is to be like well you just are you're you're in the stories because you're you're the writers but i don't i'm not comfortable entirely with that you know, I mean, do, do you need to ask for permission? I mean, I think going forward now with a wife and child, I think I will um, ask for permission and, and 
you know, I mean, I think similar to, you know, your relationship with Ness as my relationship with Lily is they're incredibly smart, very astute, bright people who I, in my case, want to run stuff by Lily um, and want her feedback. Um, and I, and I, I know you and Ness talk about your work and vice versa. And, um, and inside of that, there is, I think, tacit permission that is granted or not granted inside of that. Um, so go ahead. I mean, it's, it is fascinating, Nick. I, I, what I didn't think before doing this book. Um, so, like, one of the first people I showed it to was a, was one of my high school friends who I actually used his real name because he's an amazing human being. Um, I love him very much. And in doing the book, um, I've really gotten back um in touch with him his um his mother passed away while i was writing the book and i reached out we've really you know it's the kind of person i can get on the zoom with and we can spend the whole evening just like remembering just spitting teachers names out and then just laughing till we cry we don't even have to say anything this like we don't even have to tell the stories just the memories come flooding back and i sent him the book um and he read it really quickly it was one of the first people i sent it to and it was really a surreal experience because it was something I hadn't really thought about uh, before writing. I thought a lot about my family um, and a lot about my family here. But he wrote back a long, beautiful email you know, about the memories it created and um, how much he loved it. And then his final paragraph was, you know, I'm a bit annoyed. I'm not in the book a bit a lot more. Like, I thought I was a much better friend to you. Mm. Then I clear. Then I clearly am because I don't appear as much as I should do, and what it's made me realize about my own childhood is that I thought I was your friend. You thought I was like not as close as I, I was projecting our friendship, and you know I had to write back to him and be like, "Dude, this is like I'm not Winston Churchill. This is not my twelve volume autobiography where every fact of every detail is in there." I was like, "There's so much that was edited out. So many bloody stories. You're in loads of them." Mm. Um, but what I didn't realize was what you write in and what you leave out, particularly in a family setting, can actually change the way the family see themselves for good or for bad. Your mm. art can actually can actually change lives. Mm. I, I don't, you know, I think like you know, nar narrative. Oof, it's a it's a much it's a big question, which is you know, so much of how family is, whether there's a show or a book written about, every family has their stories and every person inside of those families has their narrative um, that are perpetuated by the family, uh, both good and bad. And and I think, even, so even without a published, now this is, we're sharing it, you know, you're sharing your book with the world, I share my show with the <laughs> world. and But it, it's no different than the stories that your mother and father would tell about you or Nige or Amy, or in my case, you know, Jeremy, Vanessa or, or Dana or myself and what kind of kid I was or what, you know, and we, we tell these stories that become, become the stories of, of who, who we are to, to our family. Th these books and, and shows are, are, are a much more heightened version of it, but it's no, I still think it's similar. It's a similar thing, which is we, we are, we are both fighting um, the narratives that are built around us and we, and, and simultaneously embracing them and, and perpetuating them. Uh, and oftentimes we're doing that sometimes in direct opposition to the narrative that has been established about us. So I think that, yes, those for sure, those things can have an effect on, on how w we or our family perceive ourselves or, 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 or you know, our siblings or, or parents or friends. And I think it's a very interesting thing, which you bring up, which is the idea of if one is not included, like some people would rather be mentioned <laughs> negatively than not at all. You know, like uh, I, I think about Rushmore. It's a separate that Rushmore, that Scottish boy, you know, with the broken arm who just was like, always wanted to be in one of your fucking plays. You know what I mean? It's just like sometimes they just want to as, as much as they don't seem to want to be. They want to be included in some way. I don't know. God, It's amazing that you mention him because I went to school with a hundred of that person. And, you know, <laughs> I think it's one of the, <laughs> I, 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 you, when you write a book, it's a very funny thing to do an epigraph. I will be quite candid. 
Um, it's like such a weird part of the the blurbs is a weird part of the process. At awkward AF part of the process, and the epigraph is like a really bloody weird part because essentially you're getting to use someone else's words that are inextricably better than anything you're about to write mm. for the rest of the world. They set a tone, but you know when you're writing it, they're always going to be in your shadow. And I chose one that I've spoken a lot about over the past month from from Langston Hughes, the incredible poet, mm. and one I've not talked a lot enough about. And I wish more people had asked me was um, was from Jason Isbell, um, who uh, came on our show and just blew me away with just his, his vulnerability and his humanity. And it's a line I've always loved from Hope the Highway, um, which is, I used to want to be a real man. I don't know what that even means. And you mine that theme hard too, you know, after working on Big Mouth and human resources. And in one of my book, in my book, one of the themes that I kept going back to was rejecting the kind of all prevailing manliness, that Scottish guy in Rushmore manliness that reigned in my childhood, you know, macho, Anglo-Saxon, angry, lager guzzling geezers. But I didn't know what to replace it with. And shuffling through, essentially the whole book is me just shuffling through American popular culture in the search for one. You know, I, I love Tom Hanks, who I got to spend some time with. I wanted to tell him, but I, I didn't know how well it would like be an icebreaker. I love Bachelor Party Tom Hanks. That Tom Hanks, when that movie came out, granted it's not aged well, but I, I thought he was so effortlessly... Just, oh, my God, I wanted to be that. To me, it's his finest role. Obviously, I write a lot about Don Johnson. I try to be Don Johnson. I couldn't pull off Don Johnson without razor-sharp cheekbones. <laughs> and then there were false turns, Ducky in Pretty in Pink, Cameron in Ferris Bueller. Moonlighting era Bruce Willis did save me. Really, And I don't know why more people, you know, write that show off. I don't talk about it at all anymore. It's spigot of a mouth. Run DMC, the same, the spigot of a mouth, the fire hose, spit rhymes. Boast, swagger, make those swaggering boasts come true. They were very deeply influ influential. I'm wondering, who did you want to be? Uh, well, I think Beverly Hills 90210 was very big when I was right at that age, 13, 14. And I think I I wanted, I mean, I wanted to be. You wanted to be, you wanted to, you wanted to run the peach pit. I wanted I wanted to be the old man who was friends, <laughs> the old man who was friends with all of them. That's what I wanted. I, I, I so wanted cool. to be Luke Perry. I wanted to be Dylan, who's sort of brooding and from a broken family with like a beautiful car <laughs> and uh and just like great, you know, like just always like that. Um I think I sometimes felt like I could be not not as good looking as Jason Priestley, but sort of like the, a nice straight down the middle guy. And then I think I ultimately felt more like Brian Austin Green, the, the dorky wow. DJ who was trying a little too hard and always was wearing one too many pieces of clothing that to get to get attention. But when I read in your book about Ducky, you know, and 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 all of the stuff around the John Hughes movies in in. And that level, I mean, it's so crazy to think that you were obsessed with those John Hughes movies and then lived in in Winnetka or went to New Tree or what, you know, that that you spent that time there. At, at do you, I have a question for you. Do, what happens if you don't go to Chicago for that summer? <sighs> My God. <laughs> I mean, tiny butterfly flaps its wings in one continent and just... <laughs> I think probably I think the great crash of 2008 would have definitely happened earlier. I think um, uh, the Netherlands would be underwater and all Dutch people would now live in Germany. It would be seismic. It would be that kind of level of change. I've got to be honest. I can't imagine. I can't yeah. imagine. not there was, there was a moment in my Chicago experience when I actually did move here. It was bloody hard when I moved to Chicago. It was not like this. My book, Reborn in the USA, is about the American idea, the American ideal. The actual moving to Chicago part, I'm beginning to process now as I start working on volume 27 of my autobiography. The that that part was really bloody hard. And there was a moment where I almost got fired from a job that would have made me uh, made my stay in America almost impossible. And um 
And it was, I can't, that darkness, that when, that night when I went home, I just remember thinking no more baseball in my life, no more like coffee shops, no Starbucks on every corner, no, you know, walking into the supermarket, having wide aisles and just 87 kinds of mushrooms to choose from as opposed to just the one they have in England, which comes in a can. Um, I, but I, I, I fought so bloody hard to stay here. I can't imagine. Um, and one of the surprises of writing the book is how tonight I didn't think I think about myself as a very negative uh, bloke um, who's really pretty cynical. But man, when I read that book, the book is really about an optimist who's incredibly tenacious, and that that really surprised me. I can't imagine Nick to be candid about not having made it and and putting this love letter out, which has been received by Americans really joyously and in a nuanced way. Has been remarkable when you when you put something out there. I mean, you put something out there. I have put something out there in my small way. It's incredibly liberating, and I'm fascinated. Going back to that question about you know the the the, the male role models we had. Mm. You no, know, does you have become for a number of people. I mean, there's a massive. Both of us have um, an audience who are deeply connected to to the thing that we work on, like the a deep emotional. Um, connection between uh, men in blazers and our audience like it's mm -hmm. a it's a conversation that we're having and i watch big mouth mm -hmm. and the tattoos that your fans get and just the devoted nature of it how do you feel now that there's a number of people in america you know young people men and women who look at you and say when they're asked you know who's my model and they mm -hmm. say you know nick kroll now mm. i mean it's it's me it's an amazing thing to to try to wrap wrap one's head around thinking about growing up and again similarly like you know wh what were we watching what what influenced us and clearly i think for both of us and in especially in reading your work um and what in reading this book but and just thinking about how much pop culture frames uh and and became the engine for who you are and who and how you saw the world and and you talk about your someone you think of yourself as, as as a pessimist and yet this is a real optimistic <laughs> book i mean it's an optimistic boy who who's going to leave as you talk about li the people of liverpool looking out into the sea for something and and here you are now you know years later drinking a budweiser uh in your home studio uh you know like having written a hugely successful book putting your own your own uh your own stamp on on American and international culture, um, which is a beautiful thing. And I, I, I mean, I feel very lucky to think about, you know, watching the shows that I watched growing up, the cartoons, the uh, whatever, all the stand up specials, the things that and to think that someone is watching what I do, both as a kid, but also as a young adult or a college kid thinking about getting into this and 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 more than anything, thinking about how they want to do it, um, that that to me is uh, exciting. Um, and uh, and I think like in 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 how Big Mouth now has evolved from starting as me and Andrew's stories as a as the engine for the show, and now by season six and even well before, tr trying to be able to tell other people's stories and and bring other people in to help tell those stories. Um, that are not necessarily like straight white Jewish boys, you know, coming of age. Um, uh, to be able to begin to tell other people's stories is is a good feeling, um, and hopefully having people see their stories reflected uh, somewhere in the show. And as as I've said from the beginning with Big Mouth, and I think you, while your story is very specifically your story about being a a, a a boy from Liverpool with with dreams of coming to the U.S. and that like ultimately we all feel quite alone in that in this particular period of time in our life um and some people feel alone forever and other people find people to connect with or realize that everyone felt alone or feels alone that that hopefully in in watching my show or reading your book that it makes people feel a little less alone in this time uh especially as you write this through the pandemic that that that's the hope right that's a beautiful note. I want to ask you one last question, and then I want to take a question or two uh, from the pile before we wrap. But you talk about other people writing stories. And at the end of my book, 
I wrote a line in the acknowledgments that I think a lot about. It's one of the last lines of the whole book. And it's to my children, Samson, Bear, Zion, and Oz. I wrote, this is my story. May you write yours differently and better in your own voices. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I do, I do mean it. I really mean it. Because I do, I, I am a kind of gen that wants my kids to be better than me um, mm-hmm. in every single way. But my Lord, if one day one of them writes a memoir about growing up with me, I'll just say, I'm not sure if I'm ready. And you just became a father. Mm -hmm. And if your kid writes that book or Mm -hmm. unleashes a television series like Nick and me, the real crawl show, (laughs) would you be like, yes. Or would you like, would you like David Burnett and be like, say, my God, what have I done? Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I think it will, you know, depend on how, how well he writes uh no i think it's um tr- truthfully it's like like you said i think the 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 hope is that uh you know and i and i my family uh it, as you know is incredibly supportive and there's definitely times the things that i've done have not been the thing that they would be most excited about but i think to watch your loved one succeed is a beautiful uh thing and you can only hope that your progeny so whatever they choose to do that they that they find all i can ask is that they find that something they love to do and and have the blessing of being able to do it uh because that's something that so few people get right like that that so people people want to be a writer and they don't have the facility to do it or the success that they would hope for and some people get to be successful but they don't write about what they care about whatever it is so um, I only hope that, you know, for my kid and hopefully kids and your your kids, my niece and nephews, just find the things they like to do. You're a beautiful human being. We're going to take a couple of quick questions before mm-hmm. we wrap. First one up, it's a beautiful question. Thank you. Better than anything. This is like the, the epigraph of my book is better than anything I wrote. And Adam Beckett, you have asked the question that's better than anything that uh, I was able to conjure with Nick. You, you are remembering, Adam, when I um, opened the book with a conversation with John Green, the magical human being mm-hmm. and life force. And we talked, uh, I mean, I'll read the question. It, I, I said that um, being vulnerable and open is the only way to truly experience life at its best. And Adam wants to know whether I can expand on that a little. I mean, Nick, that's how you live your life now, being vulnerable and open. I mean, there's two paths. There really are two parts. Um, I mean, I don't know if that registers for you at all before I run my mouth off. For sure. I mean, I think it's, there's no, no doubt that that vulnerability is, and, you know, as, as you talk about whether it's, you know, whether it's John Green or, or the people that we love and, and even the athletes that you talk about, like, the, like their fridge, you know, captivated America partly because he was a physical anomaly, but, but because there was some vulnerability there that was, you know what I mean? That he, that he, he, he was captivating because of that. Um, uh, and, and I think like, you know, that whole bears team, you look at them, there's something there that's like that, you know, I mean, the idea that Walter Payton stopped to take a photo with you, you couldn't get the photo off and then was like, I got to go <laughs> is like heartbreaking. But you're like, this is sweet. This is, this is sweetness. But also, you know, he and Mick, Jim McMahon in his own way, you know, like anyway, the, the, there's a reason that team captivated America and the world because they were all in their own weird way, vulnerable, uh, you know. You know, to me, that team actually taught me that after 20 years of just being self-sabotaging, self-destructive losers, they could turn into winners. And like, I did see that team like, oh my God, I've been a failure. I've been a disaster. It is possible to rewrite your script. Mm. But Adam, the reality is we've all been locked down. Everyone has, everyone's had trauma. There's been darkness. There's been loss. There's been fear. There's been chaos. And you know, we all had that before we went into lockdown, but now it's just been compounded. And I do believe, like, for us to heal as a nation, as a world, um, the only path forward, the only path forward for open to us is to Simone Biles it and to to just let it out and and speak exactly how you're feeling and work at it and talk about it. Not You don't have to share it with the world, 
you know, you don't have to, you don't have to do, don't do this, but you, 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 you can just find people don't, don't really don't keep it in Find people. It can be one person. It can be a group of people. It can be friends. It can be a partner. You know, a lot of men in blazers is dealing with those questions that we get via email and, 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 and being there in dark times, but really yeah, for me to, the only, to add on to that, just in, in you know, in Big Mouth, we season two at a, the the new character was the Shame Wizard, and um, ba- played by David Thewlis, uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, which is an, was a but, in, but but a huge part of what we found to, to rectify shame came through Brene Brown, who um, talks a lot about vulnerability and talks a lot about the the main issue of shame is 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 the petri dish of of, of silence. Um, and other things that I'm now forgetting, but but I think it, as you talk about in, in coming out of COVID, it's you don't need to be necessarily writing your memoir, or tweeting every minute, or making big mouth, but but being able to share what's going on with you on a personal level, I think not only will will, will just alleviate some of that shame that we so many of us feel for whatever it is for for having a a, a little spigot uh, as a 13 year old or. Or, or you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, getting pants or whatever happens to you as a child or as an adult, the, being able to speak about it and be vulnerable and share alleviates so much of the pressure of that shame. God, uh, hundred, hundred. When I say it's the only way forward, I do think it's the only way forward. You have to articulate what is going on, not blast it out to the world, but find a way to get it out of you. Second question, we'll take a couple and then we're going to pull this beauty together. Um, it's a great question from the mighty Al Lopez, who says to Rog, does it confuse, astound you when you hear stories of kids in America dying to live in England or a stranger in your own land, just one of the universal stages of the conveyor belt of life? You know, Al, I have had thousands of Americans um, reach out to me. The first actually was Mina Kimes, who during that weird blurb, uh, period, which is so, I mean, I, God, I'd like to write a book about getting blurbs because it is so psychologically um, <laughs> nuanced. And Mina read the book and then she reached out to me and she said, you do need, you, and may I, she told me what she thought about the book, uh, which thank God was positive. Um, and she said, you do know, I grew up wishing I lived in Manchester. You know, I was a huge Cure fan, huge Smiths fan. Mm. And I just wanted to live like in Salford with Morrissey and all that crap. And I was like, oh, my God, you dodged a bullet. But listening to her talk about it, and I, I mean, I, Nick, you may have wanted to live somewhere. I, I just think it, what I've learned by doing this is that it's an it's a adolescent norm to just lie in bed at night thinking about your own weaknesses and wishing you live somewhere else, wishing, you know, you could be alterna Roger, alterna Nick, funnier, you know, slaying. Everyone laughs at your jokes. Everyone listens to you. Everyone fears you and loves you in equal measure and all that crap. And that's what I've realized in the book. That is just a, that's a deeply common human experience. And I think the only thing that is mildly special about my experience is I actually acted upon that. I actually carried it through. I actually, did the equivalent of moving to Salford and living with Morrissey. I mean, did you, was there a moment when you wanted to, you were like, damn it, with the Kroll family, I want to go and live in, I could get in China. I know, well, I, 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 you know, and again, the beauty of living in the Kroll family was that I I got to go to China when I was 13 with with Andrew Goldberg. (laughs) His his mom had been working a lot. (laughs) His mom had been working in Hong Kong and they had, miles so me and andrew went with his parents during uh thanksgiving and i got to go to the great wall and got to see china at 13 um and i've had i've been able to go to so many places in the world at a young age i got to see it all and and honestly i don't think i i would have admitted it then and i don't know for you whether you knew in your heart of hearts when you were 13 that you were gonna that you wanted to be a writer and that you and obviously you knew what podcasting was in 1983 and and, (laughs) I spent a lot of time just talking to my friend who had a can with a piece of string attached and he had a cow's it which was essentially what podcasting was was when I started with Dave at the beginning extensively it is um but I think I I don't think I would have admitted it to myself but I think I what I wanted was to be a actor and comedian and but i don't 
even as yeah. as 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 much access as I had growing up, I don't think I knew one could actually go do that. Like I didn't think it was like we grew up around like lawyers and and doctors and stuff. Um, and so I think I in my head I was like in my perfect world I'd be in Hollywood making stuff. Really? I mean, yeah. that's a, this, I, we'll we'll take one last question and then I mean a lot of them are about football and I've got to say Sarah Hatch and others I will answer all of those on uh, Thursday's question. The Premier League does return next week. I am excited. Am I terrified? There's nothing for me to be terrified about. I'm an Everton fan. There's only darkness. Darkness is the only <laughs> way. But Sarah, so we'll chat about Tottenham a lot on Friday in the WGFOP podcast. I promise we'll answer that. We're going to end with Don's question. Uh, and then we're going to wrap it up because you, uh, dear viewers, have been so bloody generous with your, your listening time. You wrote, Don said, huge fan of you both. Don must be my mother I'm misspelling her name. When you were younger, and this taps into your comment a second ago, which is why mm -hmm. it's a great ending. When you were younger, could you ever have imagined yourselves being as, and I can't even read the question. One of the things about writing a book is that I, I, I'm filled with self-loathing. When people say, oh, I love your book, when I go on, tell, on shows and like, oh, we love your book, I can't, I always look down or I'd like, what, I'd like, oh, I pull a weird face. I'm not very good at taking compliments. And, and my wife is like telling me, I've just got to lean in and say, thank you. And just reading that word, successful, is like hard for me to read. But that's the question. When you were young, could you ever imagine yourselves being as successful as you are today? What would young Nick? I mean, it was were you just one of those, you know, I interview a lot, a lot of hockey players who were like in the my dream from age 11 was NHL or bust. I mean, I, I hear that and I'm like, oh my God, really? Is that really, God, could that really be possible? But it's, I hear it again and again and again. Were you like, this is happening, I'd like to be it, this is happening, it's going to be, uh, I'm going to be Rodney Dangerfield or bust <laughs> or die shying. Yeah, just delivering stand-up one-liners in the midst of a movie where everyone else <laughs> regularly. Um, I could have only dreamed. Um uh, I, no, I mean, I think I, uh, I think like, I think if like 10 years ago, like a working actor or whatever, uh, I, I think I, in my heart of hearts, I was like, I, I think I could do all right if I, but I don't think I discovered until college that I wanted to do this. Like, I don't think I admitted to myself. And then at that point I was like, well, now I'm going to, this is the one thing I've only wanted to do. And like, what I identify with those hockey players, they learned it at 11, I learned it at 22, was that you have to go full throttle. And watching the Olympics right now, and I'm sure for you watching and talking about football all the time, like these people have a, have to have, a, you have to have a singular focus and desire to do this. And, and even then most don't make it. You know, I think about that watching the Olympics and I don't know if you, when I watch the World Cup, uh, you're like, oh, that guy was the is the best player from his town ever, and he just got absolutely fucking smoked <laughs> by that other guy, you know. So like, so there's all these different levels of success. The idea that I could be a working actor or comedian was would have would it was a dream of mine that I believe was likely attainable, and I was able to do that. What what I have been able to do is beyond anything that I could have ever imagined. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and just, I just feel very lucky that I get to, to do it. And more than that, I get, feel lucky that, that here we are, you know, having done, uh, I think the books are bar mitzvah disco together 15, 16 years ago, and are now here talking to each other about these things that we've done separately, um, and coming back together. And, you know, um, I've been so deeply impressed by what you've been able to accomplish and 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 accomplishing your own way um on your own schedule and on your in 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 your particular incredibly unique and powerful voice um to be a witness to that and occasional uh a participant in it is is an incredible joy for me so it's been uh, i just couldn't be more impressed with with what you've done and 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 this book in particular is is just uh is a, is a real testament to to your uh your incredible talent thoughtfulness wit and um and uh humanity so it's it's a been a pleasure to 
to be a witness to it and and to be a, a part of it in any way that I have been. So I'm, I'm you, you, that you, I'm going to channel what your your sisters told me to say and just look into the camera and say <laughs> thank you. Uh, but that was that was bloody generous, and you're a gorgeous human being. Of course. Um, you know, the, the, my answer to the question would be would be I never had a goal about what I wanted to be. I knew mostly my life has been defined by what I don't want to be, knowing that and letting that just propel me away from it at some rate of knots. And I've been laughing a lot recently, thinking about the path I've gotten to be here. Um, you know, when, when the book hit number one, um, I didn't feel any joy at all. I felt no joy whatsoever. I just felt like overwhelming relief, like yeah. I've never felt before in my life. Uh, that the sacrifice that my family had made while I was typing away like a madman amounted to something. And ultimately, my life feels that I was uh, laughing with my wife the other day that my life feels like I'm, con I'm I'm constantly in a car that's going really fast and people are trying to throw me out of it. And if I have any skill, I'm really good at holding onto the bumper, like really good. You know, that movie scene, I'm like really good at tenaciously holding on. So the honest truth is young Rog had no real dreams other than getting out there and, um, and everything else is just bloody a tribute to good short term planning. So I am I, I, I am trying to parry Nick saying nice things by moving away from them, which I'm now going to move back to. You're a beautiful human being. That was a um, I mean, that was a beautiful thing you said. Um, and it makes, you know, with the bomb, it's for this thing. It makes this feel like Simon and Garfunkel at Central Park came back together for one fleeting for one fleeting uh, concert. But my God, what a concert. We're going to put this out as a double album. It's going to play on C-SPAN books forever. And I just want to say to you, the audience, I I've loved this. I want to say uh, to Nick, I'll get to Nick in a minute, but to you, the audience, for participating, for listening, for supporting all of this, so supporting me, the book, keep spreading the word about it. It is so hard bringing out a book. It's such a, it's like, painting a masterpiece on a tiny grain of rice who the hell wants a tiny grain of rice nowadays but the way you've responded to reborn in the usa it does mean the world to me um book suit i'm so indebted to you i love you are a thrill of any trip that i have in la and for book suit if you're listening to this here live or if you're listening to this later on wherever this gets released whenever it gets released think about that indie bookstore that is close to you. They are so much more than bookstores. They are hubs of community. They are they they push out ideas and creativity into the cities and towns that surround them. They really are lungs that we we need. They are all struggling so bloody hard at the moment. And whatever you can do, and you guys have all supported this book at indie bookstores, which genuinely is one of the thrills. So thank you, thank you to to Booksuit um and nick you beautiful human being for delving into the reality that the more things hurt as a kid the more you can process them into something truly joyful and and just life affirming as an adult that's what i think about when i look at you when i watch your um your many um uh, many projects it's about Ultimately, pushing joy into the world is one of the most important things we can do right now. It's such a rare bloody currency. And I love watching you. I'm inspired by it. I try and do it uh, in my own small way. So to more, to you, to your family, to our listeners, to all those who supported the book, big shout out to Book Soup again. Keep supporting Indie Bookstores America and courage. Big love. Ciao. Thank you both. So, so <laughs> that was a lovely conversation. Thank you both so much for joining us and bringing your vulnerability to your projects and to all of us. It was really a joy to have you. I'm a huge fan. So it was really wonderful to have you both. And thank you, Roger, for being such a champion of independent bookstores. It really is important. And I won't expand there because he really said it all. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone in the audience, for watching and taking the time. And please keep supporting indie books and um, sharing Rogers. So congratulations again, and everyone have a wonderful rest of your night. Courage. Good night. Bye guys. Thanks.